All right. Uh, good morning is wrong because it's good afternoon. Uh, and welcome to fiscal 2021 preliminary budget hearing. My name is Andrew Cohen and I am the new chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I would like to note that we've been joined uh, this morning by, or this afternoon by Councilman Yeager and Councilman Kozlowitz. Uh, we will be reviewing uh, the projected budget of the Department of Consumer Affairs, DCA for uh, FY 2021. Specifically, we will be assessing DCA's programs and activities to ensure that the agency is serving the public in a physically responsible way. Uh, FY 2021 preliminary budget for the Department of Consumer Affairs totals $45.3 million, uh, which includes $29.9 million in personal services funding to support 433 full-time positions. The funds in FY 2021 preliminary budget are primarily allocated to resolve consumer and worker complaints, issue numerous license, educate and protect consumers, and ensure that businesses comply with local and state laws. In a few minutes, we will hear from the administration on specific plans uh, for these allocated funds. In our hearing with DCA this morning, it is my hope that we to explore different areas of its budget to gain clarity and transparency on where and how funding is spent to protect consumers, create financial empowerment for New Yorkers, and educate businesses on their responsibilities to consumers and employees. Specifically, I look forward to hearing more from DCA regarding whether its citywide savings program will limit the department's ability to carry out its work and an analysis on whether its vacancies pose a significant risk to agency operations. Lastly, I would like to examine DCA's uh, reporting in the preliminary, uh, preliminary mayor's management report uh, to gain a better perspective on how we align, how well it aligns its budget with performance. We will first hear testimony from the Department of Consumer Affairs, then members will have a chance to follow up with questions uh, for the commissioner. After that, members of the public will have an opportunity to provide testimony. I hope that the commissioner or members of her staff will stay to hear testimony from the public. I look forward to working with the agency and other interested parties in order to finalize the budget over the coming months. Uh, in closing, I would like to thank my the committee staff, uh, Sebastian Bochi, Bal Keys, I'm gonna butcher this, Meherig, yep. uh, not so bad, uh, and Leah Skipizek uh, for their work, as well as I'd like to thank uh, my ledge director, Patty and Trader, who's here someplace. Uh, and for all their help uh, putting together this committee. And now I will ask council to uh, swear in the panel. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. I do. Thank you. Please. Good morning. Oh, good afternoon, Chair Cohen and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I'm Lorelei Salas, and I am the Commissioner for the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today about the agency's uh, budget for fiscal year 2021. Before I begin, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to congratulate you again on your appointment to lead this committee. And I uh, look forward to working with you and your colleagues, including new members of the committee, on what I believe to be among some of the most important policy and programmatic work before the City Council. Since its founding in 1969 to today, DCWP has transformed from an agency singularly focused on enforcing the city's consumer protection laws to a dynamic resource for consumers and workers alike. DCWP licenses more than 75,000 businesses and individuals in more than 50 industries and enforces key consumer protection, licensing, and workplace laws that apply to countless more. In my preliminary budget testimony last year, I reflected on agency successes and previewed strategic priorities heading into the 50th anniversary of our founding. Today, I will share more on how the agency is building on its successes. Equally as important, I will highlight our legislative priorities and why they are necessary for DCWP to adapt to the modern marketplace and comprehensively fulfill its mission to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers. Last year, I briefed the committee on the agency's strategic priority to assess and help mitigate the student loan debt crisis in the city. DCWP's Office of Financial Empowerment 
expand first-of-its-kind research to more accurately identify and quantify outstanding debt owed by New Yorkers and the factors that contributed to delinquency and default. Last spring, DCWP utilized that research to launch a multilingual public awareness campaign entitled Be Real About Student Loans. Because our research and outreach suggested a need for reliable information about payment options for prospective students, the campaign sought to inform New Yorkers about their rights and responsibilities. The campaign ran in the city's subway cars, bus shelters, as well as in print, radio, and online in targeted neighborhoods most affected by delinquency and default. Today, our student loan debt education efforts continue. Building on our research and outreach, DCWP held a training on student loan debt relief resources for the counselors at our financial empowerment centers. The counselors then staffed a series of student loan debt clinics in 2019. We have a slide up right now that shows you in numbers uh, uh, the results of our clinics. Um, and we continue to provide guidance to New Yorkers year round. Of course, we continue to evaluate other interventions that would help us address the city's student loan debt crisis, including the expansion of key initiatives to encourage child savings accounts, and we look forward to partnering with the council in these potential solutions. Moreover, the agency is overseeing an expansion of financial empowerment centers citywide, from 26 to 35 centers, all of which are open to anyone over the age of 18 who lives or works in New York. In addition to student loan debt relief, these centers will continue to offer New Yorkers resources on budgeting, how to improve credit, reduce debt, and much more. Since their creation in 20, um, 2008, these centers have helped clients reduce debt by over $73 million and increase savings by nearly $6 million. A priority of mine at DCWP has been to reduce burdens on small business owners. This mandate continues to be realized with an increasing focus on business education and dedicating resources to programs I have championed, such as the Visiting Inspector Program, or VIP, which has provided free educational inspections for more than 6,000 new brick and mortar licensees. In calendar year 2019, the agency partnered with elected officials to double the number of business education days it held in 2018 from 14 to 28. These educational walks and other business-focused roundtables accounted for interactions with upwards of 1,500 business alone. Since 2014, we have issued nearly 28,000 cure-eligible violations, which potentially saved businesses up to $8.8 .8 million in penalties. Currently, there are more than 40 cure-eligible DCWP violations and recently, at Mayor de Blasio's State of the City, the administration announced an expansion of cure eligible violations across multiple city agencies, including DCWP. We look forward to working with Council to continue supporting small businesses and reducing fines. Overall, DCWP reported another consecutive year of decreased fines on businesses, a decrease of over $200,000 compared to calendar year 2018. Most recently, DCWP worked with Council to successfully repeal the outdated Home Improvement Salesperson License category. Established in 1969, an internal review of the HIS license category had shown that it was redundant of our Home Improvement Contractor License. With the license set for repeal, home improvement businesses will no longer be subjected to two sets of fees and licenses for the same area of work. Moreover, the agency will be able to streamline processes to ensure expedited service. We hope to work with Council to continue to identify further opportunities to streamline licenses, compliance, and regulation. Finally, the agency recently conducted a penalty mitig mitigation analysis and is in the process of promulgating rules to have certain civil penalties waived if businesses make their restrooms available to the public. 
When finalized, this program will be another resource available to small business owners in lieu of financial penalty. With the implementation of the paid sick leave law in 2014, DCWP took on the role of implementing and enforcing private sector municipal workplace laws in the city. Today, DCWP is a focal point for labor issues and a dedicated voice in city government for private sector workers across the five boroughs. As such, complaints received by the agency have steadily increased over the last three calendar years, totaling over 1,100 by 2019. The city is now regularly leading or among national leaders in protecting workers' rights. The city's expanded paid safe and sick leave law made New York the first city in the nation to extend safe leave to survivors of human trafficking and domestic violence. The city's protections for freelance workers are the first of its kind in the country and remain a unique protection for freelance workers. Similarly, the city was among the first to adopt fair work week legislation for fast food and retail workers and has been far out in front of enforcing its fair scheduling laws. DCWP is continuing to build on its successes enforcing these critical laws. In calendar year 2019, DCWP obtained resolutions of approximately 3.2 million on behalf of workers, about a half million more than what was obtained in 2018. These numbers are in large part a result of our strategic affirmative enforcement. DCWP uses its proactive enforcement authority to maximize worker recoveries for past violations and future compliance for entire workplaces. In 2019, for example, DCWP obtained resolutions totaling $571,000 in combined restitution and penalties and future reporting and compliance measures as a result of a proactive um, investigation and litigation into 13 home health care agencies employing more than 13,000 workers. These settlements were part of a broader affirmative enforcement initiative covering 42 home care agencies across the five boroughs that collectively employed more than 50,000 workers. In addition, DCWP regularly conducts large-scale workplace-wide enforcement actions against major national brands. In November, DCWP announced a settlement with a McDonald's franchise operator in Queens for violations of fair work week and paid safe and sick leave laws. In total, 155,000 in restitution was awarded to 280 workers. Similarly, DCWP announced a settlement with Starbucks stipulating that they create a um, $150,000 restitution fund for current and former employees for violations of the city's paid safe and sick leave law. Starbucks will also be required to display an educational poster in a public space about paid safe and sick leave in all of its New York City businesses. DCWP is currently in litigation with Chipotle over alleged violations of fair work week and paid safe and sick leave laws. DCWP also remains committed to ensuring integrity in the marketplace. Deceptive and unfair trade practices have no place in the city and our agency remains committed to exercising its authority to investigate and prosecute instances of unlawful behavior. One such instance includes our ongoing commitment to combating immigration service provider fraud, sometimes known as notario fraud. Following non-compliance with a previous settlement agreement, DCWP filed new charges against Buitron offices and associated defendants for using deceptive advertising and marketing to lure immigrant New Yorkers and then defraud them of tens of thousands of dollars. Buitron's deceptive acts included misrepresenting himself as a lawyer and lying to consumers about how they could obtain citizenship. Another case involving our consumer protection law was filed in September against T-Mobile and Metro PCS New York for alleged violations that included selling used phones as new, deceiving customers as it relates to refund policies, and overcharging customers. 
The charges brought forward were the culmination of a lengthy investigation spurred by over 100 consumer complaints. As noted earlier, the CWP licenses over 75,000 businesses and individuals citywide. During the review of renewal applications for tow companies, the CWP uncovered irregularities in insurance documents they are required to submit to the agency. Further investigation, including subpoenas issued to dozens of insurance companies and brokers, confirmed that numerous licensees had submitted insurance documents altered to appear as though the company had the legally required insurance when it did not. The agency will be making final determinations on these licenses in the coming weeks. As I mentioned earlier, the CWP celebrated its 50th uh, or golden anniversary this past April. Our investigative enforcement and programmatic work detailed tangible successes for New Yorkers and responsible stewardship of taxpayer resources. To be frank, however, these successes are despite ambigu ambiguities in our laws that require clarification to reflect the Council's legislative intent. Without legislative updates, the consequence may very well be an agency in its golden year, but with silver standard tools at its disposal. Our agency's founded, uh, founding is rooted in the city's consumer protection law, a landmark municipal protection intended to deter businesses from engaging in unfair uh, trade practices and to empower consumers to seek recourse. We can all agree that the city has changed a great deal over the past 50 years. For example, business advertising and solicitation via the internet is an increasingly popular means of consumer communication. However, the 1969 Consumer Protection Law is silent on the scope of its protections in this space, since it did not envision a marketplace in the digital age. And in a city of over 8 million people, including more than 3 million immigrants, over 200 languages are spoken every day. A modernized consumer protection law should enshrine protections for New Yorkers who negotiate a transaction in one language and are then asked to sign a contract in English even if they do not speak that language. The city's most vulnerable communities, including low-income, immigrant, veteran, and aging New Yorkers benefit from DCWP's protections. These protections, however, are only as effective as the laws and rules behind them. For example, further amendments to the city's charter and administrative code are needed to clarify that DCWP can seek and secure restitution and equitable relief across all of its laws and rules. In 2017, our agency brought charges at the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, Oath, against a business for preying on immigrant New Yorkers and falsely advertising identification cards to protect these consumers from immigration and customs enforcement. While the administrative law judge ultimately ruled in our favor and awarded penalties, the ruling also held that the agency did not have the authority to secure restitution from businesses that are not licensed by the CWP. Even if a business har has harmed a consumer or worker, restitution is a cornerstone protection that further holds unscrupulous individuals financially accountable and, importantly, provides victims with compensation to cover their losses. Additionally, an amendment is necessary to clarify our authority to inspect businesses on site for workplace violations, a common compliance tool for labor enforcement agencies. I am immensely grateful to the committee for holding a hearing on both introductions 1609 and 1622, which will address these concerns, and I hope that you will join me in pushing for full consideration and final passage of these common sense bills as soon as possible. Now, in my fourth year as DCWP's commissioner, I am privileged to witness the hard work of the dedicated public servants employed by the agency, Perhaps even more so, I am humbled by the results-driven work that, with the Council's support, has sought to address the most pressing ch challenges of our time. As an immigrant New Yorker, I have ex uh, experienced many of these challenges firsthand, challenges such as student loan debt distress, unpredictable scheduling, unpaid leave, and others. 
Legislation before the Council, such as paid personal time, will enact critical protections for New Yorkers to address these issues, and I continue to be thankful to work with my colleagues in government in search of solutions. Thank you very much for listening, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I just want to note, uh, I think that you and I have already met uh, twice. Uh, uh, you've been very welcoming, and I really do look forward to uh, working closely together, so I appreciate that. Uh, I also want to note that we've been joined by Councilmember Lander, uh, and uh, before I have prepared questions, but I thought before we, um, we get to that, I'd like to ask you to take a moment uh, to talk a, a little bit about uh, incidences of price gouging related to the coronavirus in New York City and what the agencies uh, responses. Certainly, um, and thank you for asking. Um, we had received in the last 10 to 12 days a number of reports from council member offices and community-based organizations that they were hearing from their constituents about price gouging with regards to face masks, uh, in particular face masks. And so um, just a few days ago, we sent out inspectors from our office to do a survey of a number of uh, businesses uh, throughout New York City to check for both uh, price gouging and whether the products were actually, um, um, there was a shortage of these face masks. So under our consumer protection law, we have um, the ability to issue a declaration um, in during extraordinary circumstances such as now, for instance, when there's a shortage of a certain product, uh, we can prohibit price gouging um, um, to protect consumers, right? And so uh, I myself went out to, to a, a store last weekend. Um, it was a business reported by Council Member Chin. Um, and I did that just because my inspectors already had instructions to go to other businesses. And masks were being sold for $213 when regular prices were less than $10. Um, and we, we know already that the health um, expert's guidance is not you know, to go out and buy your own mask, right? Uh, but people are afraid, they're stressed out. Um, so our declaration was effective yesterday, and for the next 30 days, it prohibits, it makes illegal to, to, to be uh, price gouging consumers. Uh, it makes it so that we can go out and assess fines if we find that a business is doing so. Uh, we are ready to, to have our team today go out to do some outreach. We want to make sure the businesses that we have identified already uh, perhaps doing this uh, are aware of the declaration because there's a two, days gray, um, two day grace period. So we're doing that today and then soon after we'll be sending out inspectors to make sure that they stop that practice. Uh, I, I know sometimes uh, you know gouging when you see it, but is there like a statutory definition of what gouging is? It's in, in some, in, there's a, at least a New York State statute that says over 10% of the price, um, that's the usual price, could be considered price gouging. I mean, we have an important provision in our declaration that says if you, know, if you increase your price more than a normal fluctuation, we will want to see documentation, a justification for that, right? We do, do not want to discourage businesses from trying to secure these masks. If they have to pay a premium for that, we want to see that. And if the premium that you, you know, the documents you have justified and you're charging more, that's fine. But you cannot be charging these prices and trying to take advantage of time of, of fear in our communities to, to make a quick buck. Uh, do you know how much, uh, what the staffing levels are related to trying to go out and, and, and serving what's going on? Uh, well, we are, you know, we're, we're having uh, some of our outreach staff just go out to, to hand out the, the information um, door to door. We're translating the, the language into, we're making a plain language and translating it in, into several languages, right? And then we have just a, a few inspectors who are going to be out looking at, um, at the businesses where we, had, we, where we had seen the really high prices. You know, I just want to say, like, we did do a survey and not all businesses are doing that, right? Some businesses are just running out of the, the face masks. And, but we can compare the prices that they were charging when they had them, which were normal prices between like five to $30 maybe per box, and not these prices of 100 to $100. 
Uh, and lastly, what about other products besides the, the masks? So our, under um, our law, um, our declaration, we need to find two things, both that there, there's a shortage and, um, and, um, and that they're actually price gouging, right? And so we did go out in the field uh, about two days ago to check for hand sanitizers, and at the time, our survey showed that they were still in stock, so we couldn't use that declaration then. Uh, but we'll continue to monitor to see what happens in the next few days. I think that makes sense. Oh, for the for the paper bags, yes. That's not us, right? Um, yeah, I mean, so that's that's right now is being enforced by New York State. Um, so. Um, yes, I mean, I don't, we can obviously look at it too, but um, we can get back to you on that. I do want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Koo. Um, as I was uh, saying to you before the hearing started, I, I do something crazy at budget hearings. I like to ask about the budget, so I do have some specific questions just in terms of how the agency is funded and the funding levels. Um, I think in, in the opening, it said the headcount at the agency is 433. Uh, are there vacancies? How many vacancies? Mm -hmm. Yes, our headcount is 433. Uh, we have about 38 vacancies currently, um, and then 10 staff members who are on leave, right? And we cannot backfill those 10 positions, um, but we're working steadily on trying to fill the 38 vacancies. Uh, how does that compare to last year? The it has increased, right? Yeah. The, the vacancy rate has increased. Um, I can let Nick, um, I'm sorry, I don't think I introduced them. This is Nick Rosa, my Assistant Commissioner for um, Finance and Administration. And to my left is Kenny Minaya, Chief of Staff. Um, but the vacancy rate has increased. We had made some progress last year um, in filling the vacancies. Um, and we've been having a harder time um, backfilling the positions. I just want to add, um, Councilman Cohen, that uh, our um, overall headcount has re been reduced as part of the citywide peg. Uh, we were at 450. Um, we dropped to 435, and then we lost another two additional headcount because of a grant um, that expired. Uh, the, the 38 uh, vacancies, can you tell us a little, what, what the lines are? What, what, what kind of people are we missing? Uh, the majority are in our licensing and enforcement um, unit of appropriation, which um, is how most of them are housed in the uh, OLPS unit, which is our Office of Labor and Policy Standards. Um, we are attempting to re do our best to recruit um, staff from um, for private industries, specifically investigators. Um, however, it's, it becomes very difficult to um, compete with private industry um, salaries and, and looking for someone with experience in that in that field. Uh, can you tell can you tell me a little bit about in terms of experience what what, what the jobs pay like what are we what are we looking for out there um, I, I think what I, what I can say about that I mean um, we are about I think at forty to fifty thousand dollars salary range um, what happens is that uh, pursuant to collective bargaining agreements uh, we now have to offer a reduced rate for new hires and that makes it uh, more complicated to, to actually bring people on board. Um, but typically, I mean, it, it is, it's usually someone with either, either with a bachelor's degree and some, ex, some investigative experience or someone with a high school education and just um, equivalent number of years in having some investigative experience. Um, so it's not that there aren't people out there. Um, we have actually had people reject our offers of employment. And what kind of attrition rate do you have at the agency? Uh, currently, we're without the leave about nine uh, percent. Uh, if you add leave, it's about eleven percent. Um, I'm checking this. I'm checking this. Uh, in terms, can you talk a little bit about uh, specific vacancies at uh, labor policy and standards? Um, as of right now, we have about 11, 11 vacancies in the Office of Labor Policy and Standards. Um, it is- Out of a headcount of what? About 40. 
So it's it's yes, it's uh, it's yes, it's almost a third. Are, are there particular challenges related around finding people to staff that office? You know, I mean, the cases that we handle in the Office of Labor Policy and Standards do require the investigations are very time intensive. You have to review a lot of records. Um, they're not, you know, they're, they're not your typical uh, patrol inspector job where you're going in looking for posters and signs. You have to do a lot of analysis of documents and payroll and time cards. And um, like I said, I think we are not competing well in terms of salaries. Um, there's, you know, that's been a difficulty for us. Uh, we're working really hard to try to fill the vacancies. We do everything we can. Um, but there's also, you know, there's, there's a process now for non-exempt positions um, that have to go through several reviews within the administration. Um, I think it's DCAS and OMB and OLR and several agencies. So that slows down the process for getting someone on board. Too. In terms of entry points, are there fellowships? Are there uh, internships? What are the other opportunities for people to sort of? Um, well, we explore everything. Every time there is a city fellowship or something that and our, our staff is very good at researching what's out there in the world um, and to try to, to get people on board. But um, for a lot of the positions for investigations, you really need um, you know um, people who are going to be able to I honestly, I haven't found many fellowships directed at investigators. A lot of them are more for attorneys. That's what we've come across. Uh, we're open to everything. Um, but I think um, it's, it's just been very challenging lately to, to get those positions filled. And then the workload has increased per investigator. And when that happens, sometimes people feel tempted to go to another position that is, you know, it's less challenging. Do you, do you have the ability, though, to design your own fellowships or internships? Um, I mean, we haven't looked into that, but we could explore it. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned a little bit also about you know, outreach, because the agency, if people don't know about the services that your agency provides, it, it's all for naught. So could you talk a little bit about the marketing and what you do in terms of uh, outreach? Certainly. Um, and, and yes, I mean, we do outreach via a number of ways, right? Marketing and advertisement is just one way in which we can uh, have a lot of uh, impact and cover no, a good number of, of workers and businesses so that they understand their obligations and their rights under the law. Um, but we also do a lot of on the ground outreach via um, just uh, our connections and uh, close working relationships with community-based organizations and others. But in terms of the spending that we have on public awareness campaigns for fiscal year 19, um, we spent $2.1 um, million on our public awareness campaigns. Um, and then another $1.3 million, um, sorry, that's $1.3 million in advertising and another $800,000 in uh, costs related to translations, et cetera. And uh, our public awareness campaigns have most recently, and you probably will see this very soon, one of them is uh, our free tax preparation work because we're doing the tax season. That's, you know, it's, it's very important for us to spread the word that people can access these services for free. So you'll be seeing them soon. And most recently we have, um, um, had campaigns around uh, workers' rights, making sure that individuals across the city and businesses know that we are the central resource for workers' issues in the city. As well, um, student loan debt, and uh, also advertising that we have the financial empowerment centers, and we've expanded those services. In terms of outreach events, we conducted 540 events in 2019, and those events cover everything from, you know, every service that we provide at the agency, but we certainly include information on workers' issues, which are super important. Um, about 191 of those 540 events were just about workers' uh, um, protect, worker protections or worker laws that we enforce. Multiple events a day, though, that, that's great. 
Um, in terms, how much of that is done by the actual agency? Like the, you you don't do your own advertising, I assume you you. So a lot of the the sign of the 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 ads it happens in house. Uh, so for instance, right now we just finished designing. Um, a campaign for Fair Work Week loss, where we didn't finish yet, but we're in the middle of that. So the design is handled in-house, but then we use contracts through Department of Health to uh, just make placements in subways and bus shelters and other places. But it is, um, it is um, funding that is assigned to us, to the agency. So. The, but even the advertising you do through an, through another agency, like do you, if you want to do it, I don't know if you do TV or, or uh, like what what are the methods like methods I guess you use for advertising? Yeah, so the the most I think I, where we spend the most money in advertising is really in subway ads and bus shelters, um, and that is um, it's our money, but we have to leverage the contracts that the Department of Health has because they have these very large contracts in place and uh, we just don't have our own separate contracts and we just don't spend as much money. So we use those contracts because it's just easier to get them placed. Um, but that's not the only way. Obviously, we try to use earned media as much as we can. We use a lot of um, ethnic media too. So as part of... Um, you know, when we buy ads, we're buying them not just in like English language media, but about half of our funding goes towards ethnic media because we know that a lot of the workers are just going to be workers who, whose primary language is not English. So when you're contracting for like the subway ads, that comes out of your budget, but it, you give the money to the Department of Health and the Department of Health. Exactly. Yes. We're just using them as a vehicle for, um, for getting access to those contracts that are in place, but it's our funding. So could you, like for print media do you, or, or the subway ads, do you know what the budget is for that? What? For um, the subway ads, we transferred about 400 and some odd K to, to the Department of Health for those placements. Um, but like the commissioner said, we, we do also print, um, um, and that's, that won't be reflective in our advertising budget. That's in that $2.1 million budget. So there's a lot of uh, outreach material and prints in, in addition to just the placements. Uh, in terms of contracting in general, I guess really that's, uh, uh, you know, the uh, PS is obviously the, the, the largest chunk. In terms of how much money do you spend on contracting? Um, about 5.8 million just for, and most of that resides in our OFE, uh, Office of Financial Empowerment, uh, for the uh, annual tax season initiative and the financial empowerment center. Uh, and so you, you award like grants for, for, for the tax preparer? Are they, who do you give the grants to? Are they yes. for-profit companies? Are they not-for-profits? Yes, just give me one second. Take just your time. One page. So um, for the financial empowerment centers, we have, um, as I said, we have 35 centers now and seven organizations that are receiving the funding, right? And so for that, uh, we have about- I'm sorry, seven org Seven organizations who receive contracts to manage the financial empowerment centers, of which we have 35 centers now. Um, and that's about $2.6 million in, from city, the city budget that goes into that. And an additional, um, I can't remember the exact amount, but we have some private funding too that goes into that. But from the city budget, we're spending $2.6 million in the financial empowerment centers. For the free tax preparation um, centers, we have um, close to 133 um, sites, which include in-person, virtual, drop-off, and non-public sites. Um, and we are right now in about 43 out of 51 council districts. And I need to find where, how many organizations are receiving the funding? 11. Uh, so 11 contracts for the free tax preparation service. That's great. Uh, I'm going to take a break for a second. Council Member Koo, you had some questions? Uh, thank you, Chair Cohen, and thank you, Commissioner Commissioner Salas. Uh, 
My question is related to the, the reason coronavirus. Right? Um, many businesses are tremendously down. 50, some like, many restaurants, bakery stores, almost every type of business, in, especially in our area, in the fashion downtown area, has been down a lot. Um, but meanwhile, we saw more like uh, uh, vendors selling stuff on the streets. Mm -hmm. So you create an, an, an equal platform. Well, business owners, they have to pay rent, uh, pay salaries, pay everything. But all these vendors popping out on the street to sell like masks, sanitizers. Mm -hmm. um, there's nobody to, to enforce any laws there. Usually police don't enforce uh, vendor laws. They say, oh, it's up to consumer affairs to do it. So I'm asking whether you, uh, your agency uh, has done anything uh, to, uh, to get rid of those illegal ones. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just, I see people just uh, uh, bring a box and put some things on the, on the sidewalk and then sell. And it's completely uh, out of line, you know? Mm -hmm. And po consumers have no protections. Sometimes they buy this face mask, uh, very poor quality. Mm -hmm. and, but they, they have no way to complain when the next day they are gone. Or, mm -hmm. So that's one question. Uh, the second question is about you mentioned consumer affairs going to enforce uh, price gouging, right? The overprice? Yes. Well, uh, I want to know, like, within what range is price uh, mm -hmm. gouging? Because uh, this is a free market. When people buy stuff more expensive, they sell it more expensive. Well, even Uber, when you call and diff you buy Uber at different times, they charge you different price. They have peak times and they have slow times. So uh, it's really hard to, the, to say, hey, you guys are overcharging this. So I want, you, I want to listen to some guidelines. How much is overcharged? If I buy this for $1, I sell you for $2. Is it overpriced or $3 is overpriced? It depends how much rent they pay, right? How much, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but I buy a cup of coffee in Flushing for $1.25, but when you go to Midtown, it's $3. It all depends. So you cannot say, hey, you know, you are overpricing, you are cheating customers. So I want to hear from you, like, what are the guidelines? Mm -hmm. So the business owners don't know, like, hey, this is, you know, they, they don't want to, like, you guys go in and give them a fine, you know, for selling some stuff. Or, or you are overpriced, you know. Can you just answer those two questions? Yes, for absolutely. Yeah. Yes, thank you for your questions, mm -hmm. Council Member Ku. Um, so to address the first question, um, and uh, so you're absolutely right. We do license general vendors, uh, and we do not do the street enforcement. But I would like to make sure that my team is looking out for this specific situation um, because it is very much related to the face mask issue and so we're going to be having our staff having a little more presence in those areas in which we're seeing um, price gouging of face masks but we would like to come in also and see what's happening in your district with respect to these vendors that are popping up now um, so we will follow up with you today um, and with respect to um, price gouging and guidance so us at the moment, we're putting together our guidance for businesses and also guidance for consumers. Um, we're having it translated right away. Uh, today, our team is gonna be going out to, to businesses to inform them of this declaration because we know not everyone has heard the announcement. Um, and so one thing that I can tell you that under state law, they're looking at an increase of 10% over a normal price to be considered price gouging. Now, for us, what we're saying to consumers and what we're saying to businesses is this. As a consumer, do your price comparison, do your research to see what, you know, what the regular price should be. For businesses, they are the ones who know what they were selling at before the virus, right? So if you as a business was selling the face masks at $50 before this coronavirus situation happened, then that may be your normal price. But if you were selling them at $10, and like I said earlier, I was in Chinatown uh, on Saturday last weekend, and I bought a, face, a box of face masks for $213 when they usually go for $10.
So that's clearly price you gouging. You actually bought the face mask? You bought a, you, you a box? Paid for it? I paid for it. It's evidence. I, I'm it's not evidence. keeping them. Yes, because <laughs> it's not something that we're recommending people to buy, right? It's not what we're saying people should be using the hand sanitizer, soap. So um, it is evidence to justify our our declaration, but it, that is a clear, to us, a clear case of price gouging. Now, the one thing, one, um, I think our, our declaration is very sound because it also allows for um, businesses who are incurring additional costs to get those masks, right? If you can show to us, you know, yes, I was buying these masks before myself from the manufacturer at $5, but now I'm paying $100 to get them here, yeah. then that's a justification for charging more money. We just want to see that, right? If you can tell us, yes, here are, here are my receipts, mm. um, then that would be fine. And so we're making sure that as part of our guidance is clear that if you have the justification, we're gonna, you know, you're gonna be fine, right? But we're working on that. We'll make sure that you have in your hands also our guidance so that you can also make it available. But, and if you have places where you recommend that we go to provide this guidance, we'll be happy to take that too. How soon will, you, will those guidelines come out? So the guidance um, is available today already, but we're translating it into many languages. So we're hoping by tomorrow um, it'll be ready or end of the day, we're rushing it. Because I also received a complaint from a, a, a store. They showed me a letter from the Attorney General, uh, said that they are overcharging the uh, uh, customers. This guy, like, he said uh, he was paying uh, $25 for 25 masks. To me, that's not overpricing. You buy a dollar a mask, you know. It depends, on, it depends on the quality of the mask, right? Mm -hmm. But Attorney General sent a letter, a very serious letter. You, know, you had to answer in so many days with all these details about the sounds like that this guy is cheating the customer. Mm -hmm. Well, when, whenever you go outside to buy, let the buyer be aware. Well, like you said, you compare three places to buy things. Nobody forces you to buy things, right? And he buy 25 masks for $25, and he sent a letter to the Attorney General saying, and the Attorney General has to investigate this. This is the waste of taxpayers' money for $25. Mm -hmm. oh. It's not that he's charging him $1,000 or $125. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it is over, no, over, when you're over, what, what you say, over diligence, you know, you're, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, yeah, I'm not aware of the Attorney General's letter, um, but. Um, uh, I think, uh, I have a copy of yeah, the office, yeah. Okay. So the, to me, this is kind of like, silly, you know? you know? You take complaint from everyone, uh, saying that, oh, this guy's open charge, and then this store owner get afraid. They say, oh, now I have to, do, to answer all these questions, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had to, I had to uh, make sure that he doesn't get a fine, you know? Mm -hmm. So it is, the government is good to protect the customers, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't want to do it on the over. Mm -hmm. And then you scale off the... Yeah. The business owners, then they, oh, I'd rather not sell the stuff. I'd rather keep it for myself, you know? And uh, I, I, I agree with you, and that's why we are making sure that our staff will be out in the field first educating some of these businesses so that they understand who we are, what we're doing, what the guidance is, and uh, doing enforcement after. Yeah. Because if you want to do it that way, you can go to the airport, right? They charge you $5 a bottle of water. I can buy it for 50 cents. Well, how come you true. didn't say they're overpricing, right? <laughs> it depends on the location and the, the, the timing, you know? Now it's a critical time. Nobody has the stuff. So, of course, when you have stuff... Uh, I would just also add that, you know, for our enforcement, and even in this case, even we do find price gouging, you know, the businesses will still have the availability of, of uh, appealing that to the to oath, right? Yeah. And so there's still a full administrative process here. Um, it's not just us, you know, being able to, um, without any oversight, being able to issue the I know, money. I know you can go to oath, but you no, know, time is money. Nobody has time to go to oath, you know? It's because then yeah. uh, they, uh, they have to open the store, right? So if they go to oath to complain, to answer a complaint, uh, they have to hire somebody to watch the law. Sometimes they cannot hire anybody to watch the law. We would love to work with you to make sure that that particular business who's, or the businesses that are reaching out to you with those letters, we would like to make sure they have the, our guidance in their hands. Yeah. So, and that, you know, obviously we'd like to work with you on that. Okay, thanks.
Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I just want to follow up on two points uh, that uh, Council Member Koo raised. Um, uh, one, in terms of uh, languages uh, that you're working on now, what languages are we translating the information into? And is that, do you have a normal kind of? Yeah. Yes, we're translating them into 10, the 10 designated languages that we need to translate them into. Which are? I don't remember off the top of my head, but <laughs> okay. uh, Spanish. Uh, uh, for whatever was in uh, local law 30 of 2017, council member, the 10 designated languages, uh, we can. If, if I don't remember it. voting for it, you don't have to remember which one, but, but it's available. Uh, and then uh, also in terms of, uh, do, do you have strategic partnerships with other law enforcement agencies where maybe sometimes you encounter something and that it makes sense to work collaboratively? Could you talk a little bit about that? Definitely. Uh, we do. We work really closely with um, Commission on Human Rights, with SBS, with MOYA. Um, and we're working with them on this particular outreach to make sure that we're doing the best we can to cover all areas of the city. So both for education, but also to hear um, back from them if they get any reports on price gouging. What about law enforcement, the, the DAs, the, oh, the Attorney um, General, for instance? So we, we have uh, been in touch with the AG's office. We did not know that they were sending out any letters on um, face masks, um, but we have talked to them because they have, they have different authority from us. Their state law has a different threshold for uh, looking into price gouging, and so um, we understand that they, they are, have more of an abil ability to go after price gouging on uh, with respect to hand sanitizers, because that is considered to be a vital good that is needed by the public right now, where face masks aren't, right? That's really not the guidance. So, um, so we are always talking to them because we don't want to be in a situation where you have two, three agencies coming after one particular problem or issue, right? So, so we do that. Um, in other situations, we do work with Manhattan, the Manhattan DA and other DA's offices. Um, but um, right now, uh, we have an ongoing relationship really with the AG's office. In some cases, we've worked on um, paid sick leave cases that also um, had um, allegations of minimum wage or overtime underpayments, which are state laws or federal laws. We work with them to investigate those cases. For instance, Starbucks was an example of a collaboration between the AG's office, Labor Bureau, and my office. Um, that's been a really great resolution uh, because it provides for for relief for um, provides for a restitution fund for workers who are um, denied the paid sick leave, but it also requires uh, Starbucks to do something that we think is very uh, creative, especially as you mentioned the fact that we don't. You know how much are we spending on outreach and educating the the communities, right? So the poster that you see on the screen right now is a poster that Starbucks, all Starbucks locations in New York City, are required to display in a public space. Now this is important because this is about the law, the protections that workers have, but this is something that, as a customer of Starbucks, you must see when you walk in, right? And that's part of our settlement agreement that they have to do this. Um, we designed the poster with them, and that is part of how we try to make sure that the message is very present for our communities, that paid sick leave is a right that they need to enjoy, especially today, of all days now, uh, paid sick leave could be life-saving. Uh, we want to make sure that workers are taking the time and are getting paid under the law. Uh, and that, you know, that's something that's going to protect both workers, the businesses, and the consumers, right? Um, we know that in a lot of food service establishments, uh, workers have, don't have as much access to basic leave, and that's a place where you are putting consumers at risk. So this is just one way in which we're trying, I don't know the number, total number of locations of Starbucks in New York City, but there are many. Infinite. About 300 of those, uh, and they, they now were using them to send a message out there that paid sick leave is the law. Uh, so if you see a Starbucks location that, and you don't see the poster, let us know. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Lander?
thank you very much, Chair, and uh, welcome to the Chair. It's great to have you in it, so thanks very much. Uh, Commissioner, and uh, thanks to you and your team for being here and for all the good work that you're doing. It was an honor to be out with you last week uh, at the uh, Chipotle event helping Luisa get her job back. And I just want to reflect, as I shared with you there, uh, that that reflects a, a very strategic approach to enforcement. Um, I want to ask a few questions about, you know, making sure we get those staff hired so we can be responsive to all the cases, but obviously in a situation like that where someone has lost their job, to be able to do that kind of strategic enforcement and move quickly to make sure she gets it back, I think is, uh, is just great. Um, and uh, it was really good to see the new Freelancers and Free Act uh, reporting in the MMR, which we actually, I think, spoke about last year at the budget hearing. So I appreciate your agreeing to do it and, and getting it done. And of course, I uh, was really excited just a few weeks ago to see the largest single case, almost $57,000 that Revlon owned, owed a freelancer that uh, they got paid as a result of, of the Freelancers and Free Act law and, and your team's work to enforce it. So uh, all those things are really extremely encouraging. Um, I was out last week in Seattle and I got to meet with their Office of Labor Standards. Um, uh, I will say they have a little better swag. They have like bags and stickers and some nice stuff, but um, otherwise they don't obviously yet have, you know, uh, you know the kind of enforcement reach that, that you guys have. Um, and I met with some folks from Minneapolis who are considering the, becoming the second city to do the freelance, mm. uh, the freelance law. Um, so anyway, it's encouraging the work you're doing and the way that that work is also kind of growing and spreading across the country. Um, I guess I just want to ask about and connect the dots between, uh, you know, a growing, uh, a growing body of work with more and more people coming in and reporting and what are the resources we need. Maybe those 11 lines can get us there. But I, I guess I noticed a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, freelances and free complaints uh, are up a lot, uh, which is great. That means people are learning about the law and coming in, and they were up in 19 over 18, and they're up in the first four months of 20 over 19. So that is dynamite, but I mean, more people coming means more work that has to get done. Um, and then I, I, you know, I noticed that the, on the one hand, the paid sick days complaint uh, waiting period came down a little, as you mentioned, from 18 to 19, but it looks like it's back up. Uh, again, in the first four months of 20 to 272 days. So I guess like two questions here. One on, on that specifically, well, what maybe three questions here. One, is there a target for the number of days on paid sick days? Like what do we want to have it at? Um, on freelances and free, there isn't a, a target number of days in the, in the MMR. You have the number of complaints. And, and just in general, you know, do you think that with those 11 positions, uh, if they got filled, understanding the challenges you mentioned to the chair before, is that enough to get us on the tar you know, to the target we we want? Is this something that we mm -hmm. would need to be pushing for additional headcount to be able to achieve the the targets that we have? Um, yes, thank you for your questions. I um, so first, I would just say that um, we respect to paid safe and sick leave, we had made some progress in trying to decrease the time that it took to investigate complaints, right? We're, we're on the way to reducing the number of days. Uh, because of the vacancy rate, it has been, um, we haven't been able to make more progress, right? Um, we have increasing workloads per investigator. Um, but we will con we're committed to doing that. Internally, we try to, we strive to, to get cases to under 180 days for investigations, but it really is difficult to, to, to stick to that for every case. As you might, you know, I just spoke about Starbucks. It's a case that took two agencies to investigate over several years. It's just, there are some cases that are gonna drive our average, or it's not an average, it's like a median? It's an average number of days for investigation, but we have some litigation like JetBlue and Delta and other cases that are, are on hold. So the number of days keeps going up and up, but there's nothing we can do about that, right? So for the typical investigation that's still within our office and it doesn't involve the law department or any other agency, we, we would love to stay to with like a 180 days process. Um, I think that if we get back to full staffing on the existing lines, 
Uh, so the vacancy, the 11 vacancies, will be able to maintain a good level of service for, for, the, uh, for the work that we're currently required to, to do, right? So for the laws that we are currently mandated to enforce, um, those vacancies, filling those vacancies will help us to be in a healthy place. Um, if we end up with additional mandates, uh, like just cause of paid personal time or other as, uh, you know, legislation, as I testified at the last hearing I was at, um, that will require additional resources and we'll work with OMB to make sure that, you know, we can address those needs. Great. Yes. No, you said that in the Just Cause hearing, and of course, you know, I'm fighting for that, but I'll, I'll fight for the resources for it too. And, and of course, these questions are part of that. I, you know, the, um, I see you work and your team working really hard to implement these laws, and, you know, so I, uh, but the goal of like setting targets and keeping to them is then we can make sure we have the resources that we need in there. So I guess in that vein, uh, it's great to hear that 180 days is the target. Would you be willing to go ahead and put that into the, MMR as the target because the MMR doesn't currently have a target mm -hmm. and again the goal is like not so that we can beat up on you when you don't hit the target the goal is so we can pay attention to do we have the resources that we need to you know achieve the outcomes we want it just mm -hmm. will help us and future councils uh, stay on track yeah so we will work with the mayor's office of operations I, I know that you've been asking us to include more more metrics uh, so we'll review it with them it's a process you know we have to have um, an agreement on that um, and in that vein, uh, if you could ask about putting a, a number of days on the freelancers and free act uh, as well. And, you know, again, I, my, my goal is not to gang up here. My goal is to make sure future councils see these things so they can help make sure that the agency has the resources that, that, that this good work demands. You know, the freelancers and free act, uh, I've said this before very publicly, I think it's a very super, super well-designed law because it, it doesn't require many resources from the agency, but it has the right incentives for compliance. And so we have a pretty successful story of getting a lot of the complaints filed with our office resolved within 90 days yeah. with money back in the pockets of the freelance workers. So that's fantastic. Um, we are down to one court navigator right now. It was two. So obviously this, this number may change until we get the position filled. Sure. Um, but but it's it's really a lot of a lot of work that has been done with just very very limited staffing. So I I think it's you know it's good work. No, that I mean I hope we can that model that if you're found to have violated the law, there's very severe consequences. So why don't you just quickly come into compliance <laughs> with the law is a is a good one. And I we kind of stumbled on it together. I mean really credit is due to. Freelancers Union and Sarah Horowitz, who who came up with it. I mean, I was happy to put it in the law, and I'm glad it's working. But um, I think that's a good a good model. Um, uh, okay, um, I know unpaid sick days uh, in particular that you know that's in the law in the governor's budget a proposal, and I understand there's a 30 day amendment coming to make some changes to it. Uh, I know he said that some of those will be about the possibility of quarantine for coronavirus. I know a uh, conversation you and I have had is about our ability to continue enforcing that law. It's wonderful that there'll be um, statewide paid mm -hmm. sick days. It might actually do some things in our law that we might like. Like I know I'm hearing from this, this week during the coronavirus spread from uh, physical therapists and occupational therapists who were carved out of our law and would like to be in it. and. Maybe if the state law just includes them, we don't have to go back and reopen it up. Um, uh, extending a private right of action to, to workers would be wonderful. I'm not sure if that's in the state law, but I hope it is. But I know one thing we've talked about specifically is this question of making sure we can continue to do enforcement. So can you just give us a, an update on what your understanding is of where things stand on the law and what we should be paying attention to uh, as the state budget comes to sure. fruition? Yes, and we are definitely in discussions, very much aware of what uh, the state is, is looking into. Um, we would love to preserve our ability to enforce New York City's law if it's, if it's equivalent to the state protections, right? Um, we have developed a lot of expertise in this area, four years of enforcing this law. There's a lot of work to go around. There's no need to, you know, we can't, you know, obviously the more resources we put into this issue, especially the, talking about situations that are coming up like, like coronavirus, we need to make sure that every worker who has this benefit 
really has access to it, right? Um, so if this becomes a law statewide, there's going to be a lot of resources needed to do that work, to enforce the law. And so we would like to partner with the state and be able to continue to do our work. Um, uh, one more thing I would say um, about that is that there are other situations in which um, we already have that happen. So, for instance, we enforce the tobacco laws for the state. Um, um, there's another delegation that um, that we have in, in, in the agency to enforce state laws. So there's a way to really work with each other to make sure that we're covering uh, the work across the state in a way that's smart. So we're open to that. That's great. I, I wish you were uh, enforcing the plastic bag law as well. But anyway, <laughs> that one luckily people self-comply with largely because the retailers are not happy giving away things for free um, that they don't need to. So we'll see how that goes. But um, Okay, uh, I guess my last question then um, is just the one thing I saw in Seattle last week that they're doing that seems, seems like a smart idea is that they, in their new Office of Labor Standards, have a, a provision to give contracts both to some community and worker organizations and actually to some business organizations as well for... Uh, outreach for kind of what they call co-enforcement to make sure that there's more information and education that people know their rights can come in and complain and then on the business side it's interesting I, you know they give they give contracts to some of the very business organizations who have opposed the mm. the laws mm. but on the other hand want to help their businesses be able to comply know the rules carefully mm. um, uh, so, you know, I just, I, I wonder whether that's something that we should be looking at in, in New York City, providing some resources to community organizations, worker organizations, and business organizations. You, you, your team is doing a, a good job with the outreach um, and with the enforcement, so this isn't, uh, you know, but it's a big city and there's so many businesses and so many workers and making sure they really know what their rights are. Uh, have other workers that are communicating with them uh, about that, you know, do you think for the future, uh, obviously depending on, on resources, that would be something promising that we should consider? Mm -hmm. um, so I would just say that, um, yes, I mean, we have really great partnerships with a lot of uh, community-based organizations and unions and business mm -hmm. improvement districts and industry associations, and um, obviously if there's ways to, to resource them better, so that they can do their, their jobs better and, and we can benefit from that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, we already have a model similar to that with our financial empowerment, um, the Office of Financial Empowerment, because all of the funding that we get there is to provide services in the community, but it's done via uh, vendors, right? So for instance, the financial empowerment centers, we have um, seven organizations that have contracts to do the financial coaching one-on-one. -on -one. So while we maintain the quality control of it, all the money is going into those communities and those centers to provide the services. Similarly with free tax prep, we do that. The money goes through us, we manage it, but those, organ you know, um, those offices in, the, in those communities are really providing the services to consumers. So um, yes, I mean, there's cases in which um, outreach um, by a community-based organization is super, super key and important to our enforcement work, um, and it helps us to spread the word. Um, paid sick leave is a situation where we need all hands on deck to make sure that people know about this benefit, so um, I think it's a good model. That's great, and I'll, I ask them for like the model contract that they use both with the community work organizations and with the business organizations, and when I get it, I'll, I'll share it with you guys as well. And, and in that vein of just the value of good partners, I'll just give a shout out to the folks from Fast Food Justice and 32BJ who are here because, you know, the, the, we, don't, we don't have a contract with them, and in many cases, they don't represent the workers uh, in fast food uh, restaurants, you know, they're not, they're not collecting dues, but the role they're playing, helping spread the word and making sure workers know their rights uh, has obviously been a big asset to the city in addition to the outreach that, that you guys are doing, that we are doing to make sure people n know their rights and have the opportunity and some partnership to be able to come forward. Freelancers Union does that obviously strongly on the Freelancers and Free Act, so I agree we're lucky for those partners even where we can't resource them. Uh, uh, but I thought this model in Seattle was interesting and I'll share the materials with you when I, when I get them. Okay. Thank, thank you. you for all the good work and thank you, Chair, uh, for the hearing. Thank you.
Um, just to follow up, uh, or uh, on paid sick leave, um, according to the, uh, the mayor's management report, the number of complaints your office is receiving is declining. Uh, I find that very concerning. I, I mean, it could be that we live in a city where everybody's complying with this law and there's no complaints, but I, I, I find that hard to believe. Yeah. What, what do you attribute the drop in complaints to? So, um, yes, thank you for your question. I, you know, I, in my experience, I've worked with several uh, labor enforcement agencies at the state level and then in the federal government now at this agency, and there may be a number of reasons why we don't get complaints. In some cases, it may be fear from some uh, communities to come forward and, and file a complaint with the government. They, they might make assumptions about things that we don't do, right? They might think that we're going to reveal their status if they happen to not have status to work in the, in the city. Um, labor laws protect all workers regardless of status, so we try to make sure we, like, we communicate that clearly. Um, it could also mean that there's a higher level of compliance, right? It's, it's really hard to could tell mean. <laughs> which factor. Um, but I have to say that we make the assumption always that there are going to be workers who don't come forward for either fear of, of identifying themselves or fear of retaliation, right? The example that uh, Council Member Lander just mentioned, um, the case of Chipotle where uh, Luisa got fired. She got fired because she took sick leave. Um, she got fired for that reason, and that's absolutely illegal. And so we literally walked her back to her job, um, and she, uh, you know, with, obviously with the help of, of 32BJ that actually educated her on her rights, she didn't know that was a violation of, of her rights. And so sending a strong message that we will tackle retaliation complaints quickly and um, aggressively, um, that helps to, to, to reassure communities that will be doing the work. Um, but I have to say that the numbers are, the numbers of complaints don't really re um, reflect the number of workers who are impacted by our enforcement, right? We may have a complaint from one worker, but when we go in and do a workplace-wide investigation of uh, an employer that has 50, 100, 200 workers in it, our law is benefiting all of those workers, right? Not just the, that one complaint. One thing that we do for, um, um, routinely is that we're looking at industries proactively to think about in which industries do we know there's a history of violations and maybe workers are not coming forward. So just recently we announced a settlement of a, a proactive investigation, and I mentioned it in my testimony, of over 40 uh, home care agencies. Um, that's the case in which workers got half a million dollars back in sick leave pay that they hadn't received. Um, and it's, it was a proactive case. It wasn't a case where we had a lot of complaints, but we know that it's an industry that's primarily made up of women, immigrant, people of color, right? Um, so proactive work uh, by our agency is always top of mind for us. Um, and I would just say that, um, what are the numbers? Um, so our numbers in terms of restitution for workers for paid sick leave is going up. So even though we have less complaints, um, the impact of our enforcement is, is, is just, it has grown. Mm -hmm. I don't want to let this point go though, because I, I, I guess, I don't know if I'm not convinced or it just, I don't feel like there's enough data. I don't, do you know how many people are covered by the law, would you say? Um, I think it's about no. It's about, I think it's about a million New Yorkers. I mean, I I actually am right now. I'm not remembering. I don't think I have the number here with me, but I will get back to you on that. The, the number of complaints is infinitesimally small relation in relation to the number of workers covered, and I just am very concerned that that there are really that New Yorkers don't know about the law yeah. or are not and therefore unable to make a complaint because they they don't know about it. Uh, and I would like to believe that we live in a world where the 261 reflects that yeah, everybody's in compliance and the law is great. Mm -hmm. But one way or the other, I think that we should try to find out what's going on because that number seems to me to be really out of proportion. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. I mean, our, our goal really is to make sure this benefit is available to workers, right? And if we can do things differently, better, we're open to that. I know that the Community Service Society is, is uh, always monitoring uh, 
uh, how much workers know about this law, and I know that in their last report, it, it may be already a year ago, that they stated that they believe part-time workers and workers in, um, employed at very small businesses may not be aware of the law. So we've tried to then come back with a, a public awareness campaign that was more targeted at those workers. Um, but there are always ways in which we can do this better. You know, strategies like using the Starbucks model for each resolution that we get to with a big corporation, getting them to do more proactive uh, work for us uh, is a way in which we can multiply the dollars we have, right? Uh, but I'm very open to having a discussion to what other creative ways we can uh, make sure that this law really is top of mind for New Yorkers. Yeah, I, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, of course, but you know, small business plays such a huge part in our the city's employment, and I suspect that they are hard to reach, and I expect that their employees are hard to reach, so yeah. uh, we need to figure out ways that we're really trying to you know, cover as, get access and the information to as many employees as we can. One thing I would just say about that, um, because we are very sensitive to, to the needs to educate small business owners, um, we have conducted 28 business education days in 2019. We're mandated to do 10, we did 28, right? Because we actually believe that that is the right way to, to go about um, educating people on the law. And so that means that I will go out to any uh, district, council district, and figure out um, with the elected official and, and the business uh, groups in that area which commercial corridors are in most need of outreach and education. And what we've done is we put teams of our inspectors and from my agency and oftentimes from sanitation and um, SBS to go out there and do purely educational visits, right? So it's just about education, we don't issue fines, and it's about making sure that that small business owner that cannot leave his um, laundromat or his restaurant has an opportunity to ask us questions. And I'm often there to myself uh, because we get a lot of good feedback from these business owners on what things we could do better. Maybe I have businesses in the Drum Gun Hill bid, I might suggest. Uh, Councilmember Yeager, you have some questions? Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, I want to follow up, if it's okay, with some of what Councilman Koo spoke about earlier today, um, uh, specifically with regard to price gouging. And uh, you had mentioned that uh, there is a 10 percent, um, or that's what you look for, you see if there's a 10 percent increase on in what the price had been previously. Where do you get that from? No, I, so we don't, we do not look at 10%. What I mentioned was that the New York State law um, is, they have a 10% range, more or less, for looking at price gouging. Um, so uh, we've read that, but we don't uh, use New that York number. State, okay, New York State law, is, as best as I understand, the general business law does not uh, provide a definition of 10%. The uh, general business law provides a definition of unconscionably excessive price, uh, which is a gross disparity with the normal price. And, uh, yeah. and unconscionably excessive price and gross disparity are both quotes from the statute. Mm -hmm. Where do you get 10% from? So, uh, so one, that's as, um, an introduction. Some, uh, a bill was introduced just recently. I can't remember the senator's name, Hoyleman, okay. uh, mentioning 10%. But um, I am actually was referring to a conversation my office had with the Attorney General's office, um, someone in the Consumer Protection Bureau there who mentioned to my general counsel that they were looking at more or less 10 percent range. Okay. So I, I, wanna, I do want to follow up a little bit on that because uh, some of the points that uh, Councilman Koo brought up are, in my estimation, um, quite significant. You know, if, uh, if a store normally sells something for $2 and they're starting to sell something for $2.30. That's more than 10% disparity, and I wouldn't necessarily call that price gouging. Um, but he also mentioned airports, and then we've been talking about Starbucks as it relates to uh, paid sick leave, and I find that ironic because Starbucks charges like $3 for a cup of coffee that I could buy anywhere else for a dollar. Have you ever investigated Starbucks for price gouging? No, and I mean, that is, I think, what the regular price of coffee is that they, you know, they usually post. That's who? So. That's who? I can get a cup of coffee for a dollar. It's the same cup of coffee that Starbucks charges me three dollars. Well, they don't charge me because I don't go there, but they charge all the other folks three dollars for. Yeah, and so, so one thing that I would say, uh, this declaration we issued yesterday cannot be issued under just any circumstance, right? First, there has to be an extraordinary circumstance. Um, so we couldn't just, for the most 
part, if a business wants to charge whatever amount they want to charge for a particular good, we cannot limit that. We do get complaints about that, for instance. Why is this uh, blanket so expensive? We can't do anything about it. It's really about disclosure to consumers of your prices. That's what we enforce. And, you must and, disclose and your I'm, prices. And I'm okay with you uh, promulgating any propaganda you wish to the consumers of New York, true or not true. I'm fine with that, but my concern is a bunch of folks with ticket books descending on a, the small businesses in our neighborhoods, and particularly in the neighborhoods where, um, where the, the tax-paying businesses are competing with uh, non-tax-paying businesses that open up right outside their store for free rent mm -hmm. on the sidewalks that we pay for, mm -hmm. um, not paying any taxes on that, uh, and undercutting the businesses, as Council McCoo mentioned happens in his neighborhood quite frequently, and I'm, I know there are other members here who have uh, similar issues, and maybe not necessarily in my neighborhood, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't care about it because mm -hmm. those businesses are not paying taxes, and they're competing and undercutting the businesses that are. Um, and there's no enforcement, zero enforcement by DCA. Obviously, I recognize DCA says that's not their job to enforce it, um, but uh, my concern is that small businesses in this city are are constantly pummeled by this government, by, by the other side of the building and by the unfortunate souls who work here. Mm -hmm. We treat them uh, uh, terribly uh, for purposes of funding our overbloated $95 billion budget that we're about to do. And um, I don't want to see that uh, a, a notion that in the time of fear, chaos, and confusion, we turn once again with our ticket books to the small businesses of New York and start throwing out summonses at them because they can pay them and why not? Um, you mentioned that uh, a business can always go appeal to oath, but I think we all know uh, that that's really not a, a, a solution. Um, if they get a summons, go to oath because A, as Council McCoo said, time is money um, and that's true, but more importantly, deck is stacked against them. They're going to lose that oath. Everybody knows that. Uh, oath, is, oath is part of the collection process of a summons. The summons gets issued, you go to oath, they say yes, you have to pay, then you have to pay. It's the way it works. Oath is just a step in the process until the check gets written. So the notion that you know, oath somehow is a due process uh, portion of, issu of issuing, receiving, getting, and challenging and adjudicating a summons is to me a joke, uh, notwithstanding that I believe oath is fair, but oath is fair in, com in, in relation to the statute as it's written which is that um, a summons in and of itself is prima facie evidence of the charge, and then the burden essentially shifts to the business to prove otherwise that it didn't violate the law. So I'm concerned, and, and I would urge you to, mm -hmm. be, to be cautious about how we do this, um, sending out folks from your agency with ticket books to assault the small businesses in our city. Um, I would also like to ask, because uh, Council McCoo brought up uh, as I mentioned before, airports and prices at the stores in the airports. Have you ever engaged in an investigation of price gouging at airports? Because the notion that somebody should have to pay $4 for a bottle of soda that I could buy downstairs for $1.50 uh, offends me uh, enormously. Um, and I think that we can all agree that any place you walk into in an airport is engaging in price gouging. So, so I'll go back to, um, I had begun to say that um, there are two things that need to happen for us to be able to use a declaration where uh, press gouging becomes illegal, and it's, there has to be an extraordinary circumstance, and there has to be, um, the item has to be in short supply. Um, so in this case, you know, we don't go around um, regulating pricing for anything. In this particular situation, we found it justified to issue the declaration. Who makes that declaration? The declaration was issued pursuant to my power as a commissioner under the consumer protection law. So you make the declaration, have you made such a declaration that there are items in short supply? For face masks. Okay, for yes. face masks specifically. Yes. We haven't gotten yet to hand cleansers, Purell and yeah. things like that. For face masks well, alone and it was We're hearing issued. that anecdotally though, commissioner, you, you're probably hearing that. It's only a matter of time before, you know, as chaos and, and uncertainty uh, um, I mean, I, I heard somebody tell me that there was a shortage on Amazon in buying diapers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why that would necessarily be uh, something that, an item that is picked up in bulk in, in a situation like this, but uh, he's a parent and he told me, um, it seems to always be the first thing whenever anything happens, they buy diapers, because mm -hmm. they're always afraid of running out of diapers. I mean, I'm, I, at some point, 
there are going to be other things that fall in, on your desk and you come to the determination that there's a shortage. But at the end, it's your pen that makes the declaration. So this is not, this is not a question that is academic in the sense that, well, I don't know if they're going to make a declaration and then it comes to me to enforce. You're making the declaration. By the time you make the declaration, you've already decided whether or not to enforce. So um, we did the, the issue the declaration after we did our own survey, our own on the ground uh, research, online research, received complaints from a number of offices. So it's not something that we use often. In fact, we haven't used that during this entire administration. Um, I would just say, um, yes, we'll continue to monitor to see what is happening in our communities. Uh, with respect to the general vendors issue, yes, I have concerns about that and would like to talk to not just Council Member Ku's office, but your office too. If you're seeing that general vendors are popping up in front of businesses and selling these products, we want to know about that. Can I, can I ask that you commit um, uh, that over the next, say, let's say two weeks, 30 days, 60 days, um, if you are seeing in your agency an uptick in summonses um, uh, for unfair business practices related either to gouging per se or other things of that nature to our small businesses, um, uh, that you proactively notify the chair of the committee instead of waiting until we see you again in a couple of months and then we ask you about it. And the reason I ask that is because um, Councilman Koo, uh, uh wisely pointed out, and, and again, this is something that I think, I think those members who represent those areas notice uh, better than, than someone like myself, but some businesses of, of Asian ownership um, immediately saw a drop in business um, uh, unfairly, unwisely, and, and uh, uh, in my estimation, very racially targeted uh, by uneducated, stupid people. But notwithstanding, businesses are suffering in parts of our community. And all of those businesses, whether they're in my neighborhood or Councilmember Chin's neighborhood or Councilman Ku's neighborhood, they're part of our economic engine. And when they're hurting, we all hurt because we're relying on their taxes to pay for this $95 billion boondoggle we're doing. Um, I, I would urge you to be uh, reluctant to whip out that ticket book over the next couple of months for things that you could just look away from uh, and let these businesses try to breathe. So we definitely can commit to reporting on any um, fines or you know, violations issued in the next 20, 30, 50, whatever period Proact of time would require. Proactively give us sure. an indication, give the chair an indication if you see that the numbers are growing in ways that they had not previously grown. Certainly. Yeah, we're happy to do that. We, we also, you know, we obviously have all that information on open data too, so it's available to the public, but we're happy to work with um, the chair with whatever frequency he needs the information we can provide it. Okay, lastly, and this, is, uh, this doesn't need an answer because um, I don't know if you can answer it, but to the extent that you've been encouraged to be anything like Seattle, please don't. Uh, Seattle is projecting a 3% budget deficit. Uh, their, their expenses are growing faster than their tax revenue are growing. And I'd very much not like to see our city grow like that. So don't take any advice from anybody who says be more like Seattle. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, Councilman Chid. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just chairing the meeting next door um, for our fighting for resources for our senior, and we did talk about, uh, you know, preparing uh, for the coronavirus. How do we uh, make sure that our senior all know the, the correct protocol and and having uh, and the centers? I think we're also looking at making sure that they have supplies, you know, for cleaning and, and all that sufficient. So my question is that in terms of part of the preparation, I know all the city agencies are, are meeting and stuff. How are you um, doing in terms of going out to the small businesses, make sure that they are complying with the pay sick leave? Because we, we're telling people if you feel like you're sick, you should stay home. Yeah. And they should know that they have this protection, right? And then also getting uh, businesses to post up, um, you know, the protocol, you know, wash hand and, and all the, the healthy protocol that everybody should be practicing, you know, in different languages, because, you know, we see those at healthcare facility, we see them um, at senior centers. So I think for the small businesses, um, for them, to be able to also participate. And I, 
the other thing is I also wanted to really, you know, thank you and your, your department for, you know, working with us um, to sort of like kind of, there was an investigation. I know we got complaint about uh, price gouging on masks and stuff, and you did go out um, to the small business and investigate, and then we really appreciate that because we also want to make sure that the correct information mm -hmm. uh, gets out to the public so people are not all freaking out. And, like, you know, we heard that they were like, you know, people going, <laughs> going to the supermarket and stocking up on rice, <laughs> you know, because they hear all these rumors. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that correct information is out there, people know their rights, especially, you know, there are laws out there that are protecting them. So I just want to make sure that the that your department is also coordinating with yeah. the other what other agencies are doing. Yes, and you um, you probably have heard from other agencies already that the administration as a whole is making sure that the correct guidance on coronavirus um, best practices is going out to the community. So we're using every way we can, like notifying all our licensees, making sure that all our outreach uh, personnel are out there with this information. Uh, handing it out to to businesses, to consumers, to workers. So we're using as a, as my agency is just part of the group of agencies that are doing this um, on a regular basis now, and making sure that everyone who's ever been in contact with us gets this information. Um, we are also very committed to. Um, again, reminding people about paid, safe, and sick leave, which, as as you said, it's it's vital right now. It's super important that people know this benefit exists and people take advantage of that and, and businesses are, are allowing the workers to take that leave. So um, so we're doing that um, and we're using every possible outreach method we have in our hands from, um, from earned media to um, just on the ground and emails and um, just, and, and obviously if you have any suggestions for us on, on particular neighborhoods you'd like us to make sure we are uh, have a presence in, uh, we'll do that. I was saying earlier that post-declaration, we're also very invested in making sure that um, our guidance on what could be considered press gouging and what isn't is out there with the businesses so that they also feel like they're not, you know, struck by lighting, but they have the information ahead of time. Um, so, um, you know, again, the city is very committed to, to making sure that the right information is getting into, into the hands of our New Yorkers. And also, I think we need to make sure that those information are in the various languages. And I know, you know, there have been, you know, discriminating activities going around, people telling people not to patronize, you know, Asian stores and stuff. And those are really incorrect information. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that, you know, that the businesses feel like the city is supporting them. Yes. And so I think like sending them information that they could post up, that they're, they're working together with the, the city agency. Mm -hmm. I, I know that from my hearing with the senior, with the commissioner, they're actually going to be visiting 600, you know, all the congregate senior area, including um, organization, I mean, or center that are not contracted with the city. Mm -hmm to really make sure that they have the right information, the right protocol, and so they're gonna be doing that. So are, is your agency also really gonna be proactively visiting all the small businesses to make sure that they have the right information and? So I, I would say that right now, uh, we are very focused on the outreach on, on the declaration and making sure that the businesses, again, understand what the consequences are for price gouging. At the same time, we're bringing with us information on paid safe and sick leave. Um, we have we have limited staffing, so I don't know that we can scale up to, to, to be able to cover like 600, 800 locations, but we're doing everything we can. So in addition to sending mailings and emails to the, the businesses that are part of our database, everyone's going to be receiving that. Um, and then door to door, we're going to do the best we can to go to communities from where we we're seeing most of the problems. So we'd like to work with your office and with other council members' offices to see if there are particular neighborhoods where we're seeing a more um, disinformation or more uh, instances of, of, of racism or anything that is uh, hurting businesses. And we'll make sure to have a, a presence there. 
Well, I think that from what I heard from the DIFTA commissioner, they also have to ask for uh, additional resources, personnel to, so that they can go around mm -hmm. uh, to visit all these sites. So I urge you that if you need a, additional staffing, whatever, this is the time to ask mm -hmm. the mayor mm -hmm. um, because you need to really get the correct information out and make sure that our small businesses are getting the support. Mm -hmm. So it's not just your staff. Um, that they should also provide, you know, extra support at this critical time, mm -hmm. just like, you know, other agencies are doing. So I think that's, um, you know, that, that is important. It's not that you have to mm -hmm. do it all yourself. Yeah. That's what I hear, you know, from the administration that they're providing the resources. Yes, and, and the city is working with, the agencies are working with OMB right now to think about what, what they need to prioritize and what additional resources are needed, so I'm sure You'll hear more in the next few days. And my one last question, Chair, is that I know there is like short supply because I'm hearing it from providers, from centers. You know, now like every place you go, like everybody has a, a bottle of hand sanitizers. And so I think that the city and to really need to look at how to get more supplies mm -hmm. and to make sure that our senior center or small businesses, that, that people have the supplies that they need to wipe things down and and to make sure that we don't run out. I mean, like, as a city, we need to figure out how do we provide, you know, these supplies and resources rather than just leave it up to a provider or... A, so uh, I think mm -hmm. that, that was one of the critical issues that was raised earlier. Because the Department of, uh, Department of Education they're getting extra resources to do the cleaning and, and all that. So I think that is something that we really need to have some more coordination to make sure that we can get the supply that's needed, um, especially for our senior centers and youth programs or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I believe there's a higher level of coordination happening right now where on, on daily phone calls and the agencies are being asked, you know, what, what are what resources are needed to do really essential work. Um, so I think that we have, a, um, we are really working together. Um, so I, I think you should be reassured that these this conversations are happening. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Chen. I just have a few more just in the know. Um, uh, on the uh, Office of Financial Empowerment, um, I guess we're planning to take the reporting out of that, out of the mayor's management report, the, the stats on that. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Taking it out of them? For the Office of Financial Empowerment, uh, I'm going to read you the question as I have it. And I'll, so, so it shows the number of clients served. Uh, the, the report, the mayor's management report, shows the number of clients served uh, and the percentage of those clients achieving measurable success, both... Um, well, they both decreased in, in uh, FY 2019, uh, but really uh, my concern is that we're taking the reporting, that we're not going to continue to report on that in the MMR. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not aware of that. I don't have an answer for no, you right now, but I'm happy to come back with a response. I think it's to the, to the, to the vendors that you're contracting with. I think that we're not going to report on that. Does that make sense? I don't, I don't believe that. I mean, there may be some changes on the reporting, but I, I can't speak um, right now with confidence on what, you know, the answer. But if you, you know, we'll be happy to follow up with an answer. Okay. And also, in your testimony, you talked uh, about various uh, uh, violations you find that are cure eligible or penalty mitigation. Um, I know that we're talking about legislation that might increase your ability to, uh, to implement those policies. What is the status now? Do, if you find a violation, do you have uh, flexibility in terms of not issuing a, a summons? Uh, and, in ter and also, I'd like you to expand a little bit about penalty and mitigation. So for, uh, for up to 40 violations, we can issue a curable violation, right? So just ask the business to... Uh, fix the problem, give us your proof that you fixed the problem, and you will not be fined for that. Um, 
The city is, the mayor did announce the state of the city that he wants to expand the number of curable violations and not just for DCWP, but a number of other agencies. So uh, I'm sure we'll be working with the council to figure out what's, what, what are appropriate curable violations. Um, the, the, the one thing that I would say is that both our business education days and our VIP program have really helped us to be able to have a purely educational visit with a, an employer, a business, um, where it is almost like having a curable violation because it is an opportunity to just ask questions, fix the problems, and on those days, there really is no, no enforcement happening. It's really about just giving you the tools you need to, to fix the, whatever issues we identify. So, um, I mean, those are counted in different ways, but we've touched uh, 11,000 businesses one-on-one uh, -on -one in that way, which is, again, is, is, um, um, is a program that has been um, very well received by the business community. They appreciate that the first thing they see from the CWP is not just a fine, but a visit to say, uh, here we are, what, how can we help you? Well, first, let me just say, I think that really does go to the point of Councilmember Ku and, and Jaeger, giving people the opportunity that if they're not aware of the law or they you know, it, you don't have to fight it uh, vociferously if it's if, if it's curable anyway, and you can just get into compliance and you don't have to kind of hash it out. Uh, so I think that, that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, could you just talk a little bit, expand a little bit more, too, about uh, penalty mitigation? Um, so the penalty mitigation program uh, is pursuant to legislation passed by the council. So we, in January, submitted a report um, to council uh, informing the body that uh, penalty mitigation is feasible for some of our signage violations. We identified 40 of those. Um, and the way uh, it works operationally is, uh, with the curable program as well, is that an inspector will go out in the field and our inspectors issue, issue charges. They don't issue actual fine amounts. Those uh, fine amounts are attached to the charges once the violation is adjudicated. Um, when the inspector comes back to the agency, uh, the business will receive what's called a pleading letter, and that's where the business has the opportunity uh, to certify that they have cured, and for the penalty mitigation program, they will be able to certify that they are a participant in the penalty mitigation program and that they are making the bathroom accessible to, to the public. Okay, that's great. Um... I think that is all I have for now. I want to say I do appreciate again. I, I think that we're off to a good start. One thing I did learn from this hearing is that there apparently you issue a lot of reports that I should probably uh, go look at. So that will keep me busy. Uh, but I do, in, unless you have any more questions, uh, thank you very, very much for your testimony. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay. We're going to call the next panel, uh, Shanir Lowe, I don't know if I pronounced that right, Autumn uh, Weintraub, we're going to do it all in one, uh, Hope Gozo, and Andrea Bowen. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just let, let, let everybody have a seat, and we're going to put you on a, a, a clock because it's getting late in the afternoon on Friday. So we're asking you to, to try to limit your testimony to three minutes. If you're, if you're ready, we're ready. All right. Please. Yeah. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Nero Lowe. Um, I used to work for McDonald's. Um, I'd like to thank the New York Council for, the, for your leadership and expanding, fair, and expanding fair scheduling and paid sick leave rights to low-income workers such as those in the fast food industry, many of whom never enjoyed these benefits before. Uh, fair work week and paid sick and safe leave laws have already made a difference in my life and the lives of many of my coworkers. For example, for many fast food workers now receive premium payments for last minute, last minute changes to their work schedules. Unfortunately, years, uh, years after both of these laws have come into effect, many employers are still not in compliance. Over 
2019, workers at, 30, workers at 33 additional Chipotle restaurants filed complaints uh, with the DCWP documenting, uh, documenting ongoing violations of the Fair Work Week laws at their, compl at their compliance, I'm sorry, at their, um, at their stores. And now workers at 11 Chipotle restaurants have filed compl uh, complaints claiming Chipotle violated the paid sick safe leave law by forcing them to work sick and firing them to, for taking sick leaves. Among other violations, these are troubling ac uh, accusations, especially at a time when the city is grappling with public concerns over the spread of coronavirus. The Department of Consumer and Working uh, Worker Protection has delivered incredible results for the working people of the city. In the cases in it has in the cases it has been able to pursue so far, but in order to truly affect change across the entire fast food industry, they need the appropriate level of funding. My coworkers and I in the fast food working fast food worker movement fully endorse the, the department's request for increased funding so that together we can finish what we started and truly transform the fast food jobs into family and, commu and community sustain sustaining ones. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm reading all in, I'm a 32BJ union member. I'm reading the statement on behalf of the president, Kyle Bragg. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today on behalf of the union's 8,500 members in New York City. The Department of Consumer Affairs and Worker Protection plays a crucial role in protecting consumers and workers in New York City, and we strongly believe that its funding should be reflecting, should reflect that role. In 2015, the city created the Office of Labor Policy and Standards, which, has, which was housed in the Department of Consumer Affairs. In 2017, the department was put in charge of enforcing the Freelance Isn't Free Act the Earned Safe and Sick Time Act, and the Fair Work Week Law. In 2019, to reflect its increased role as a protector of the workers on behalf of the department, was renamed as the Department of Consumer Affairs and Worker Protection. We know from, for, from firsthand experience how the department protects workers' rights. For example, the department has filed a lawsuit alleging widespread violations for the city's Fair Work Week law by Chipotle, and just last week secured old, old sick pay and $2,500 for a worker who had their rights, regard, their rights regarding sick pay violated. The department has also worked assodiously to protect subcontracted workers' rights to safeguard their health at the city's airports. We have faith in the ability of the department's ability to protect workers. However, we are also concerned that without sufficient resources, the department cannot ensure that all employees, com employers comply with the protections that have been recently extended to workers. For physical 2017, the department's preliminary budget was $40.8 million. While in fiscal 2020, the department's preliminary budget was $43.4 million. Despite a sufficient increase in duties, the department has not received a commensurate increase in funding. For these reasons, we ask you to double the allocation for the Office of Labor Policy Standards. Thank you to the Committee in consumer, on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing for the opportunity to testify. Um, my name is Andrea Bowen, Principal of Bowen Public Affairs Consulting. Um, I am speaking today, today on behalf of the New York City Network of Business Cooperatives, a trade association for work cooperative business, businesses in the NYC metropolitan area. Um, 
Thank you, Chair Cohen, Councilmember Yeager, uh, staff of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing for this hearing and the opportunity to speak. Um, so um, New York City Network of Business Cooperatives, which we lovingly call Nick Knock, um, is one of the organizations that participates in and advocates for the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative, which I'll call WCBDI, um, an initiative, the first of its kind in the nation, that Council has invested more than $10 million in over the last uh, six fiscal cycles. Um, over the past five years, WCBDI has created 132 new worker cooperatives, reached nearly 8,000 current or prospective entrepreneurs, created more than 631 new high-paying jobs with over 2,000 worker owners in New York City. Um, this budget cycle, we seek to, an increase in WCBDI from 3.609 million to 5.04 with the intent of using these expanded funds to expand our financial assistance and business skills development services, do more business to business networking, um, strengthen, spectre, strengthen sector specific work. And while this initiative is funded through SBS, um, there are several reasons I wanted to highlight it for this committee. Um, given your oversight over um, DCWP, it's germane to discuss WCBDI as a worker protection issue. Um, worker cooperatives allow workers to benefit from the value create they create, and um, there's a typical pay ratio of two to one from the highest paid to the lowest paid, which is significantly lower than what you see in large businesses. Um, also, the models built wealth in poor communities and communities of color, um, resulting in higher wages nationally, and also creating an opportunity for small business owners upon retirement to pass their businesses on to workers. Um, Nick Knock and WCBDI participants are interested in talking further with your committee um, as well as DCWP in the coming months about ways that we can use worker cooperatives to further the aims of worker protection. Um, creation of worker cooperatives and thus worker ownership of business has been remarkable over the life of this initiative and I have many more materials attached to the testimony for you. Uh, and we're interested in discussing with our partners in government the ways that increased investment could have even more dramatic scaling effects. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak before you and outline this issue, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, I would say that I am happy to uh, discuss these issues with you at any time, and you should just reach out to my office. I will also say I think I do agree uh, with the testimony of President Bragg that uh, I would really like to figure out why the role and the services of DCA is expanding and the budget is contracting. I think that uh, really... Uh, doesn't make a lot of sense uh, and unless anybody has any questions and anybody else wants to testify I'm going to conclude this hearing all right thank you very much everybody